I'm going to speak about the life of Andre Helligers and the early years of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. I'd like to say, first of all, that I'm grateful, number one, to be alive, and number two, to have the relatively intact long-term memory to be able to share some of my recollections of the early years of the Kennedy Institute. I'll first talk about the trajectory of Andre Helliger's life. Andre was born in 1926 in Venlo, the Netherlands. He was the youngest of five sons. Andre's mother was a French-speaking Belgian by birth. Her name was Jane Boland. Miss Boland served as a nurse for Allied soldiers during World War I. At the same time, she also worked as a courier for the underground resistance against the occupation of Belgium by German forces. One of Andre's heroes was Archbishop Mercier of Belgium. Andre admired the Cardinal's scholarship, but also his courage. After German armies invaded uh, Belgium, and in fact, uh, burned down the Louvain Library, uh, Cardinal Mercier spoke out openly and vigorously against the German occupation. He repeatedly urged Pope Benedict to take sides in this conflict because in his view, Belgium was an innocent victim of the invasion by German forces. Jumping ahead to the late 1930s, the Helligers family moved in 1938 from Venlo in the Netherlands to Lenaken, a small Belgian town near the Dutch border. Here I'd like to acknowledge the historical research that Warren Reich has done into the early life of Andre Helligers. It was in Lenaken that the Helligers family experienced the German invasion of the Low Countries on May 10th, 1940. As a 13-year-old boy, Andre found himself crouched in a ditch next to his 80-year-old grandmother as bombs fell on Lenaken. Leaving the town by night, the Helligers family escaped by boat to Great Britain. From 1940 to 1944, Andre attended Stonyhurst College in England. This was his first contact with Jesuits. Andre then completed his medical degree at the University of Edinburgh in 1951 and took his Belgian national boards in 1952. Thereafter, he spent a year studying aviation medicine at the University of Paris. In 1953, at the age of 27, Andre made a major decision about the next stage of his life. He opted to leave old Europe and to continue his postgraduate training at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. So we move next to the John, Johns Hopkins University era from 1953 to 1967. At the beginning, it looked as if Andre might have a rather conventional medical career with expertise in one area of physiology. He chose an interesting specialty, even though his major focus was obstetrics and gynecology. He took a special interest in fetal physiology and studied many years part time in the laboratory of Donald Barron at Yale University. He also went on an exposition 
to the Andes in 1958 to study the effect of high altitude on pregnancy. 1963 marked a turning point in Andre's life. In that year, Baltimore Archbishop Lawrence Sheehan established a Newman Center near the Johns Hopkins University Medical Center. The center was called Carroll House. Again, Andre and the Jesuits are intersecting. Andre was an active participant in the brown bag lunches held at Carroll House to discuss ethical and religious questions in medicine. The late John Collins Harvey has documented these years of Andre's life. In that same year, 1963, Pope John XXIII created the Pontifical Commission for the Study of Population, the Family, and Birth. Archbishop Sheehan was appointed to this important new body. The Archbishop, in turn, must have lobbied to have Andre added to the commission in 1964. From 1964 through 1966, Andre worked tirelessly for the Papal Commission on Birth Control. He compiled two extensive reports on fertility control, especially among Catholics, for the commission. One report included detailed medical, medical information about various methods of contraception. The other report surveyed the fertility control practices of Catholics in multiple nations. As deputy secretary of the commission, Andre played a major role in the drafting of the commission's final report. He even moved his family to Rome for six months as the work of the commission was concluding. Meanwhile, back in Baltimore, Andre received a grant of $50,000 from the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation to establish the Cardinal Gibbons Center at Carroll House. That center aimed to do research on the ethics of fertility control, as well as to establish fertility clinics at Catholic hospitals. Andre's experiences with the Papal Commission and at Carroll House convinced him that interdisciplinary discussion was an essential method for uh, seeking new knowledge. While Carroll House was satisfying, it was a small satellite on the edges of a massive leading medical institution. Andre hoped to create something that was more central to the life of a university. With that vision in mind, and at the age of 41, Andre moved to Georgetown University in the summer of 1967. Andre was appointed professor of obstetrics and gynecology and professor of physiology and biophysics in the Georgetown University Medical School. So now we begin the Georgetown era, which lasted from 1967 to 1979. How does one demonstrate the value of dialogues between ethics and the biomedical fields? One way is to recruit a senior scholar from one area of academia and provide the funding for that faculty member to become acquainted with a whole new area of his field. With support from the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation again, Andre succeeded in recruiting Paul Ramsey from Princeton University uh, to come to Georgetown. Paul Ramsey came to the uh, Georgetown Medical Center for the spring semester of 1968 and 1969. During those years, Ramsey uh, uh, interacted very vigorously 
with multiple members of the Georgetown Medical School faculty and also with scholars at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, he also read voraciously, as he always did throughout his lifetime. As a result, uh, Paul Ramsey was able to prepare what became known as the Lyman Beecher Lectures at Yale. He gave those lectures in the spring semester of 1970. I was privileged to hear the lectures as Ramsey gave, gave them at Yale. Even more importantly, Ramsey's lectures formed the basis for his book, The Patient as Person, Explorations in Medical Ethics, that was published by Yale University Press uh, in 1970. In a way, Ramsey's book ushered in a brand new era uh, in the study of biomedical ethics. He took new topics. He was very familiar with both the medical literature and the ethical literature, and he gave an overriding theme to the entire book, the covenant relationship between patients and healthcare providers. This time of Paul Ramsey at the Medical Center convinced uh, Sergeant Shriver and Eunice Kennedy Shriver that a research institute on medical ethics at Georgetown might be a feasible project. As Warren Reich in his extensive research on the origins of the Kennedy Institute has pointed out, Andre's initial proposal to the Kennedy Foundation did not focus primarily on ethics. In late December 1970, Father Robert J. Henley, then the Jesuit president of Georgetown, submitted a proposal to the Kennedy Foundation for the establishment of, and I quote, the Kennedy Center for the Study of Human Reproduction and Development. End of quote. According to Warren Reich's research, the four senior research scholars in the proposed Kennedy Center were all to be experts in various biomedical fields. Only one of the four senior scholars, Robert Baumiller, was to devote part of his time to the study of ethical questions. A regional ethics seminar program was, however, included in this original proposal. Between January of 1970 and June of 1971, the shape of the new research center changed very dramatically. Discussions among Andre, Father Henley, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, and Sergeant Shriver led to a new name and a revised focus. As of June 21, 1971, the name of the new entity was to be an Institute of Human Reproduction and Bioethics. By that time, more than half of the proposed budget uh, for the new institute was allocated to scholars formally trained in theological ethics. The institute would be located on two floors to be built above the existing floors of the Bless Building at Georgetown University Hospital. There, the institute would be immediately adjacent to the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. The institute began operations on July 1st, 1971. A press conference announcing the establishment of the institute was held on October 1st of 1971. I should say in passing that Andre had ready access to the president of Georgetown University during the early years of the Kennedy Institute. In some ways, he functioned almost like a fourth executive vice president. He consulted with Father Henley constantly and on a whole series of questions, Father Henley uh, consulted with Andre Helligers. 
I turn now to the early years of the Kennedy Institute from 1971 to 1979. First, what was our location? Uh, many of you know the DC Transit Building at 3520 Prospect Street uh, in Georgetown. It's also 3600 M Street. It's a building that stretches all the way down the hill. It used to be a car barn for the repair of trolley cars in the DC trolley car system. I'll begin with people because the people who have been involved at the Kennedy Institute have really been the key to whatever success it has been able to achieve. Um, I was the first person invited to join the Kennedy Institute, and I began my work there in July of 1971. At the time, it was Andre, a full-time secretary, and myself. In September, September 1st, uh, Warren Reich, uh, distinguished Catholic moral theologian, joined the Kennedy Institute. Warren was and is a bit older than I. Warren had trained in Rome and uh, Germany, uh, and he would later become the editor-in-chief of both the first and second editions of the Encyclopedia of Bioethics. Even though Warren and I were quite young at the time, we received the designation as senior research scholars. I was only 31 at that time. In 1973, uh, Richard McCormick joined us as the first Rose F. Kennedy Professor of Christian Ethics. Uh, Dick McCormick was at time, that time really the Dean of Catholic Moral Theologians in the United States. He edited the notes on moral theology for theological studies each year. And um, he really did deserve to be called a senior research scholar back in 1973. The next key appointment and one of the best ones that the Kennedy Institute ever made was the appointment of Doris Goldstein as the uh, librarian for the Kennedy Institute of Ethics Library. Through the next 40 years, uh, Doris Goldstein was the architect of what we now know as the Bioethics Research Library. In 1974, we hired one of the best trained indexers in the DC metropolitan uh, area, Maureen Kanick. She was the chief creator of the bioethics thesaurus, which has now been adopted in multiple countries, translated into numerous languages, and added to by other bioethics centers around the world. In 1974, there was also a serendipitous meeting between Andre Helligers and Tom Beecham. Tom gives me credit for introducing the two of them. They really hit it off well. I think they may have met for lunch in the tombs. Uh, Andre really had a second office in the tombs uh, below the 1789. Uh, Andre said to Tom, well, I can't offer you a salary. Uh, you're already being paid by the philosophy department, but how would you like an office with a view of the Potomac River, a share of an administrative assistant, and some research assistants? And Tom jumped at the opportunity and joined the Kennedy Institute in 1974. In 1975, James Childress joined the Kennedy Institute as the first Joseph P. Kennedy 
a junior professor of Christian ethics. His coming to the Institute was a reunion of sorts. Uh, Jim and Tom had been fellow students at Yale Divinity School, and Jim and I had been fellow students uh, at the Yale Graduate School. Jim was and is a leading Christian ethicist of his generation. Around 1976, we became acquainted with a young psychologist named Ruth Faden. Ruth took our intensive bioethics course in 1976, and shortly thereafter, Andre Helligers reached out to Ruth and said, I know you're a full-time faculty member in the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health, but how would you like to receive a part-time salary for spending time at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics each week? Ruth accepted the invitation and uh, became an important part of our group. Ruth later went on to be the founder of the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Johns Hopkins. In 1977, uh, Andre succeeded in recruiting H. Tristram Engelhart from Houston, Texas. Uh, Tris was both a philosopher and uh, a physician. He was always a very vigorous uh, uh, author and conversation partner. He was a passionate critic of what he called the failed Enlightenment project the attempt to build ethics on a secular basis. I guess most of the rest of us were involved in that pro project, uh, but Chris, uh, Tris was an amazing critic of the views of many of the rest of us. And finally, early in 1979, uh, Andre reached out to Robert Veach, who was at that time the senior associate at the Hastings Center in New York. Uh, Bob had already had a distinguished career as a leader in the new field of bioethics through 1979. Andre um, made uh, Bob an offer. How would you like to come to Georgetown and have free time to do research and writing full-time for the remainder of your academic career. Uh, even though Bob loved his work, his interactions with Daniel Callahan, it was an offer he couldn't turn down. And Bob was appointed professor of medical ethics in the spring of 1979, arriving uh, in the summer of 1979. So let me turn then to some of the key events uh, in the history of the Kennedy Institute. Well, a founding and important first event was receiving a grant from the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation to establish the Joseph and Rose Kennedy Institute for the study of human reproduction and bioethics. The initial grant was one point $36 million for the first four years. 360,000 of that amount were to go for funding the Institute program for the first four years. The other million dollars was to be set aside for building two floors on one wing of the Georgetown University Hospital. You may recall that there was a major international symposium at the Kennedy Center in October of 1971. The film, the symposium was called Choices on Our Conscience, and the film Who Should Survive was shown for the first time at that symposium. The film uh, retold the story of a young child born at Johns Hopkins University Hospital the child had duodenal atresia, 
that prevented any nutrition from going from the child's mouth to the child's digestive system. The parents refused surgery for the child and the child was allowed to die without surgery uh, and without medical intervention. In October of 1971, the first publication came out of the Kennedy Institute. It was entitled Book Core Ethics Library, and the subtitle was Books and Articles Presently Available at the Kennedy Center for Bioethics. I compiled this document. It had 60 pages. And some of you may recall that IBM at that time had selectric magnetic card typewriters. They could hold up to 5,000 characters. And if you made a mistake in typing, you could go back and correct it on these IBM mag magnetic cards that looked were the same size and shape as IBM punch cards. So I said to Andre, um, well, we have this 60-page list of our acquisitions. Why don't we update it every few months and uh, circulate it to interested people who are just beginning their work in bioethics? And Andre turned to me and he said, why just a list of acquisitions updated every few months? Why not an information system for bioethics? So uh, Andre was always a visionary. In 1972, the Visiting Scholars Program at the Kennedy Institute was initiated. This was a way to bring in senior scholars for a semester at a time, um, often supporting them during sabbatical leaves. It was a way to supplement the two young people at the Institute, Warren Reich, uh, and myself. In 1972, Warren Reich received a challenge grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, the, the title of the grant was um, Encyclopedia of Medical Ethics. According to the documentation for this award, this work will consist of a series of essays of a critical nature and is thus not really an encyclopedia. Projects do evolve. And in this case, six years later, under Warren's editorship, a four volume work entitled Encyclopedia of Bioethics would be published. I submitted a grant application in 1972 to the National Library of Medicine. I requested funding for carrying out Andre's vision, establishing an information system for bioethics. The application was turned down, but the project officers at the National Library of Medicine said, we think you have a good idea. You just need uh, more expertise uh, uh, from library scientists a more sophisticated strategy for ind indexing the literature of bioethics. So back to the drawing board I went. In 1973, we received a special supplementary grant from the Joseph B. Kennedy Foundation to establish a research library for the Kennedy Institute. And Doris Goldstein was hired as our full-time uh, librarian of what is now the Bioethics Research Library. During that same year of 1973, a key decision was made. Bricks are important, but people are much more important. So instead of putting $1 million toward the floor on a wing of the Georgetown University Hospital, Georgetown University and the Kennedy Foundation agreed to convert the million dollars into two endowed chairs, one in honor of Joseph B. Kennedy Jr. and the other in honor of Rose F. Kennedy. 
So uh, with that money, then we were able to recruit uh, the first Rose F. Kennedy scholar, Richard McCormick, and the first Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. scholar, James Childress. In 1974, we received funding from the National Library of Medicine to create an information retrieval system for bioethics. David Batty from McGill University tutored us on creating a thesaurus for the emerging field of bioethics. Maureen Kanick and Renee Johnson began indexing a sample set of 250 in-scope documents. During 1974, at the latest, we began holding Tuesday luncheon seminars. Papers were submitted in advance, photocopied and circulated to all the faculty members of the Institute, and we engaged in interdisciplinary discussion and debate. In a way, this recaptured Andre Helliger's experience at Hopkins in the 1960s. Students began arriving at Georgetown uh, and asked us, where's our program? And we said, we're a research institute. We didn't really plan to offer a teaching program. However, in response to their request, we negotiated with the philosophy department and its chair, Henry Veach, and were able to work out an arrangement so that students would take a PhD or an MA in philosophy with a special concentration in bioethics. Ann Neal was our first PhD graduate in 1976. Anne and later graduate students went on to become the next generation of leaders in the bioethics field. In 1975, in the cold of January, we held our first intensive bioethics course. Uh, the nickname for the first course was the Total Immersion Course in Bioethics. We then began to think that this might sound like a Protestant religious body. So we changed the name to the Intensive Bioethics Course. Arthur Dyke from Harvard Divinity School came down to Georgetown to deliver the ethical theory lectures in his first course. Uh, faculty members from Johns Hopkins Medical School joined the course for the medical lectures. And that was then the genesis of the course of which this 2021 course is a follower. In later years, Arthur Dyke did not have to come down from Harvard Divinity School to deliver the theory lectures. Gradually, James Childress and Tom Beecham uh, took over those lectures in the intensive bioethics course. And out of their collaboration on those lectures would later grow a book. From 1975 to 1979, faculty members of the Institute worked closely with the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects. Several of us wrote papers for the National Commission. And in 1978, 79, Tom Beecham was the full-time staff philosopher for the National Commission and one of the key authors of the Belmont Report of 1979. Stepping back one year, in 1978, what was originally thought of as an encyclopedia of medical ethics with critical essays did in fact turn out to be the encyclopedia of bioethics published in four volumes with Warren Reich as editor in chief. This was a really foundational document for the entire field. 
1978, Tom Beecham and I also published the first edition of our Bioethics Anthology, Contemporary Issues in Bioethics. We aim this textbook at philosophy courses in practical ethics uh, at the college level. In 1979, uh, Tom and Jim published Principles of Biomedical Ethics, the first edition. And as you know, that book has become one of the central documents in the field of bioethics, uh, going through multiple editions. During the year 1979, I also worked closely with the DHEW Ethics Advisory Board on its report about HEW support of research involving human in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer. So to sum up, the first eight years at the Kennedy Institute were very fruitful years. We enjoyed working together and we all were and are deeply indebted to our founder and first director, Andre E. Helligers. Thank you for your attention.